I wasn't going to run for office isn't because I don't like government. I actually do like service. I think public service is one of the highest callings in the land. It's second only to teaching. But the reason I didn't run for office was deeply personal in this sense. I have two young boys. They're nine and five. I was in Washington, D.C. for six months. During those six months, I didn't see my family four and a half days a week. It was tough. And when you run a campaign, you see your family even less. And you have to raise all of this money. Money is such an issue in politics right now, it turns off a lot of people, including myself. Elizabeth Warren, who is now our senior senator and with whom I had the honor of serving briefly, to win her election last year, she raised $42 million. Her opponent, Scott Brown, who's been the incumbent senator, raised in excess of 40 himself. $80 million was raised and spent on that one campaign. That's a problem. And so I didn't want Donald to sort of jump into that part of the system right now for my personal reasons. I'd also like to see if I can help sort of address this issue around campaign finance and the way that money is run amok and how it's infiltrating our system. Um, so even though I love this job as senator, the application process, campaigning, I'm not such a big fan of right now. But I respect everyone who does, because I think we do need good, dedicated, committed people to run for office and to serve. And if the process of running is such a turnoff to some of those good people, then we need to examine that process to make sure it's not a deterrent, or it's not set up such that only the most influential or wealthy feel like they can run. Because then we run the risk of not having a representative government, which is what our government is intended to be. Thank you for the question. Gun control, I think it's a big issue. Whether you call it gun control or gun safety, we have a gun problem in the United States of America. I believe we have too many guns. There's too much easy access to guns. I believe in the Second Amendment. Let me put that out there. I believe in the right to bear arms, okay? But that is not, that's not the same thing as saying everyone should, can, or certainly can easily acquire a weapon. I don't believe in that. I think, and I don't think that's what the Second Amendment says. I think the Second Amendment has been interpreted and used to great effect by those who want to abuse the system and is harming our society. I voted in favor of the background check bill that, was, that came up during my time in the Senate. It failed. The vote failed. But I think there will be other votes. And I understand those senators or those members of Congress who have some concern about this and they come from parts of the country where there's very much uh, an affinity, it's part of the culture for guns and et cetera. Listen, I grew up in North Carolina where people hunt all the time. When I was 12 years old for Christmas, I got a 12 gauge shotgun, right? In fact, I'm not much of a hunter, never really was. Right? My father was, though. he loved to hunt, he grew up hunting. Guns was a part of his life and culture. And so there's a place for it within reason. But I think we have a problem. I think we have to deal with how easy it is to get guns and the, how easy it is for guns to get in the hands of the wrong people. And I, as part of that's background checks, absolutely. I think we have to deal with what's called straw purchasing. If you don't know what that means, it's somebody who's legally entitled to buy guns and then sells them to people who aren't entitled to buy guns. And that's a major problem, particularly in our cities. Guns come from parts of the country where they're easily acquired and they're brought to our streets and literally sold out of trunks or someone's basement. That is a problem. That is a crime, by the way. And it needs to be punished and punished harshly. We also need to deal with mental health. Our mental health system is a travesty. We have neglected it for too long. And it's not to demonize or stigmatize those with mental health challenges, but we have to acknowledge 
that sometimes our, our gun and background system doesn't effectively assess whether someone has the proper mental capacity to own and use a weapon. And we just have to enforce the laws that are already on the books. And there are a lot of laws, certainly here in Massachusetts. But I think we need more oversight, more enforcement to ensure that our streets can be safer and that where guns are, they are being used effectively, they are being stored properly, and for those who abuse our gun laws, they are punished severely and swiftly. As a result, those who are legally entitled to own and use a weapon, and those of us who don't have weapons, will feel a lot safer in our communities and our homes. I do not buy into the notion that to make us safer, we should weaponize everything and everyone. I think that's a false and bad choice. This is not the Wild West. We don't solve problems by giving everybody a six shooter and say, take care of yourself. That is not a solution. That's a fallacy. And it doesn't solve problems, it multiplies problems. That's my view of it. While you were in uh, Washington, D.C., what did you do you know, in your leisure time? Like, how did you have fun? <laughs> how did I have fun? Yeah. You know, the most, so when I was in D.C., I actually stayed with a relative, so it was actually a great time for me to connect with a cousin I hadn't seen for a while. But when you're, there's some fun things, there's a lot of fun things about being center. I want to give the impression that they're all bad or difficult. I had a lot of fun. I love Washington, D.C. I spent a lot of time touring the Smithsonian which I'd done before as a citizen, but as a senator, you get to go behind the scenes. I had a special tour of the National Archives, and if you've never been there, you should go. The original Declaration of Independence, the original Bill of Rights, the original Constitution on display, it is remarkable, right? It's remarkable to think about the power of these documents giving rise to this great democracy and defining our lives and lifestyles even to this day, and they're on display. You see the actual signature of John Hancock that gave rise to the notion of signing something as putting your John Hancock on something. And we got to go in an area called the vault. And they brought out all these documents that they store over time. Do you realize every document every president has ever created or been sent to a president is stored in perpetuity? If you write a letter to President Obama, it will go in the National Archives. And 20 years from now, you can go to the National Archives and ask to see that letter. If you send an email to me when I was in the Senate, that email gets archived forever. It's remarkable. And so we went in there and they brought us all these outstanding documents. George Washington, our first president, they showed us his handwritten inaugural address. Still preserved in perfect form. Some of you may know Thurgood Marshall. You know who that is? Well, if you don't know, and those you know, Thurgood Marshall was the first African American to serve in the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land. He was appointed by President Lyndon Baines Johnson from Texas. Thurgood Marshall was a lawyer of great renown. He argued the Brown versus Board of Education case that got rid of segregation in schools. A brilliant jurist. First black man ever to serve on the Supreme Court. And as a lawyer, that means something to me. As a black man, that means something to me. And so they showed me the actual letter of appointment from President Johnson to the Senate appointing Thurgood Marshall. It was an emotional thing for me, powerful. And then they told me something before I left. They said, by the way, you know, you will, you will be in our archives. And I said, in what sense? They have on record, and keep for all time, every appointment, uh, every document from every governor and the Secretary of State from every state appointing every senator. And so they had a file, Massachusetts senator, and they brought it out. And while, in fact, my appointment materials had not yet made it there, I rifled through it, and I saw the appointment letters of Elizabeth Warren, Scott Brown, John Kerry, Ted Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, the list goes on and on, titans, 
people who form this great nation. I was like, you mean mine is going to be on the top of this pile? <laughs> and they said, absolutely. And it was remarkable. So I did a lot of that. I went to the, a lot of the Smithsonian institutes. institutes um, and I spent a lot of time actually just talking to my colleagues, trying to understand them, how they came into government, what motivated them, because that was of interest to me. Because I think that's how we solve some of this conflict. I remember the Congress needs to spend a little more time getting to know each other and understanding each other's motivation as opposed to just focusing on their politics. Because focusing on politics won't get us out of this mess. Hi, Senator Cohen. Um, due to your great connection with Jamal Patrick, is it possible for getting him to come here? <laughs> <laughs> I did, I'll put in a good word for you. How's that? <laughs> It, I, I had a little more sway over his schedule when I was his chief of staff, but, uh, you know, but I'll talk to my successor and let him know that his, uh, you guys would welcome his visit. Absolutely. We might have time for one more question, or one more question. Okay, Emma. Hi, um, I'm Emma Trudillo, and I'm in 10th grade. Um, I was wondering what your stance on was for universal health care and Obamacare. Great question. Healthcare, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, it's sort of a, it's a thing of the day, isn't it? I am a big supporter of the President. I'm a big supporter of the Affordable Care Act, um, or Obamacare, if you wish to call it that, or Romney Care, if you want to call it that, because it is based on the health care law that has been in effect in Massachusetts since 2006 and has worked to great effect. I think the Affordable Care Act is a significant signature legislative achievement by the president. And, so, and certainly I and so many others are frustrated about the website and the rollout and everything else. But don't let that fool you. Don't let that cloud cover the substance of what this law is about. There are tens of millions of people in this country who don't have health insurance, can't afford it. As a result, our health care costs are skyrocketing out of control. People aren't living healthy lives. Health care in my opinion, should be the equivalent of a right. Everyone should have the right to have good health care. Right now, our system isn't set up that way. The Affordable Care Act is designed to address those challenges and to get health care where it's needed most. It's messy. It's difficult. Right? Health care is almost the third rail of politics. There's so many interests. But I applaud the President and the Congress for pushing forward. I'm frustrated that the rollout has been incredibly bad. But I don't let that deter me from the reality that it's a good law. It's not a perfect law, right? Dick Durbin, who represents Illinois in the Senate, is fond of saying, the last time a law was perfect at its inception was when Moses walked down the hill with the Ten Commandments. <laughs> the reality is Congress passes laws all the time, and none of them are perfect. What Congress is supposed to do, instead of wasting valuable time and resources arguing about whether the law should be repealed, is focus on making the law more perfect. As President Lincoln said, we must always strive towards a more perfect union. We must do the same thing with our legislation. So where the Affordable Care Act isn't perfect, including the rollout, we need to make it better. And if it's being implemented, and it's not being implemented in the right way, or the results aren't as anticipated, then of course you look at it, you examine it, and then if necessary you adjust. But what troubles me in this debate, and I say this to my Republican friends, I said the solution here can't be to repeal the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, and you say, okay, all is well. It's dishonest, disingenuous because you haven't offered an alternative. What is your proposal to provide health care to those 30, 40 million Americans who can't afford it, can't afford the health care they have? What is your proposal to deal with families who want to keep their children on their health care because they're 26? What is your proposal to deal with those who have pre-existing conditions but then are told by an insurance company, we will not insure you? What is your solution to those who have a catastrophic illness today and their insurance company says, you've maxed out on your coverage, you're on your own. The solution can't be just repealing. And that's good. If the Republican Party wants to have an honest debate on this, 
and I'll say it to you because I've said it to them, then that debate must be centered around what the alternatives are. And in the absence of an alternative, we cannot afford to go back to the status quo because as a nation we lose. And if this law is not perfect, then bring your better ideas forward and let's make this law perfect. Because everyone in this country, in the richest country in the world, the most industrialized nation in the world, it is shameful. It's an abomination. It is un-American that we do not, that we have tens of millions of people who do not have health care. It's an embarrassment. And I support the president and his effort to do something about that. And as government officials, we owe that to the people we work for. What we don't owe them is this nonsensical rhetoric and argument about turning back from a pathway that solves a lot of problems in average people's lives, strengthens our economic underpinning, and is one of those things that sends a message to the rest of the world that as America, we always do the right thing. We take care of those who are unable to take care of themselves. And we use government as a tool and a means to an end so the people can prosper. That's what this health care law is about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Or do a group picture. We're going to do a group picture. If you're in this row, come on up. If you're in this row, please. And in this row, if you'd like to take a group picture, please come on up.